first part of this session, we're going to look at three different areas within the enterprise service management solution that we have at Microfocus. Let's take a look at how we can embrace AI and machine learning with no code within our solution. Before we get started, I wanted to take a few moments to talk about the terminology when we specifically talk about AI and ML. First real key one is artificial intelligence. And sometimes think about this as the rise of the robots taking over the world. But really, it's about how we see or perceive intelligence by machines uh, or software. The next is machine learning. And this is probably the most key one. With machine learning, it's about how machines can actually learn from examples of actions that have taken place before. So this is where we talk about having a large data set and lots of tickets, say, for example, in a service management system. The final term that I wanted to talk about is virtual agents. And sometimes this gets mixed in with, with artificial intelligence and machine learning. But really, when we talk about virtual agents, especially in the scope of service management, we're talking about a program that's based in artificial intelligence that provides some kind of automated customer service. That's not to say it's actually doing any of the fulfillment or the back-end activity. It's more about how it's going to use natural language understanding to interpret what a user needs to then provide the right level of response. Within the enterprise service management solution, we've defined three laws of AI and machine learning. The first is about having it as a built-in core capability. So for SMACs and associated applications within enterprise service management, this is about having a machine learning tool, so it's, such as IDLE, built into the core of the product. It's not something that's an additional bolted on solution or maybe where you're outsourcing that to a third party and transmitting data outside of your organization for it to be processed. We want it to be there, key within the solution, so it's used at time and you know where your data is at all times. The second is focusing on use cases and business driven outcomes. So for us, it's about trying to find the right kind of use cases of where AI and machine learning can help you and your organization deliver a better solution. And we'll talk more about that in the next slide. And finally, it's about automating machine learning. For us, it's key to make this as simple as possible, giving you those advanced service management features and capabilities, but doing it in a way where it's simple for you to consume as an effect trying to be able to do this with no code. And again, we'll show you that with some of our examples in this session. We'll talk about it from three specific key stakeholders. The first is your classic business user, the person within the business who's doing the work and only interacts within service management when they need something. The second is your agent, your typical service desk or support person that's working on the cases and the tickets that come through from those business users. And the third is a supervisor or maybe process owner, someone who has a responsibility for the overall delivery of, of that service. When we look at it from a business user's perspective, we're all about looking at self-sufficiency. So how can we make it so that that business user can get the right first time answer, be able to reduce the number of tickets that they're creating or duplication of tickets that they need to do, but also at the same time, making sure that when they're creating a ticket, it's done in a way where it's easy and understandable for, for the agents to consume. For the agents, that's where you have that overlap into productivity. So by having those business users raising tickets in a way that allows them to have the right data means that the agent can focus on being able to deal with the ticket as needed, but also then finding ways and how they can do other things within the tool faster, whether that's looking at supporting data, instantly suggesting solutions, and then with the supervisor or process owner, we're then looking about how they can drive key performance indicator improvements. So are there ways that they can look at the data, maybe through a reporting perspective or analytics to help drive and improve the overall service they deliver to the business? Let's take a look at some of the examples of that. If we look at those business user self-sufficiency aspects, one of the cool things that we've done within SMAX is smart ticketing. Now, this isn't just being able to upload a, an image into the system. This is also being able to categorize the ticket based on the data that's in there. But one of the things that we think that's quite cool is the fact that we can upload an image into the system and have, have SMACs automatically do optical character recognition 
and put that data into the ticket so it can then be used to be processed. If you then tie that into the next level where we talk about CI detection, if the users has entered in the details of their laptop, maybe their asset tag as an example, or something else that you've got listed within your configuration management system, CI detection will instantly identify that for the agent, allowing them to automatically relate that ticket to that CI and making the data available of that CI available for them to use and help resolve whatever issue is needed on that ticket. And then coming back to that business user, we're looking at how with the use of a virtual agent and our virtual agent max, how that can be used to help move forward, identify the right thing, drive right first time end user selection, either being from knowledge articles that are available or either service or support offerings to get them the help that they need. Let's take a look at some of those as examples. We can type in some answers and instantly Max is starting to return to potential options to help solve my issue. Various articles related to issues with my PC, and I've been quite generic here, but it's utilizing that in the embedded idle engine to identify the right items within the search to return the results that are relevant for me. And as you can see here, we've also got one related to repair my PC. So as part of that, is providing me the actual item within the catalog, make, allowing me to fill out the details and submit that ticket. And if needs be, I've got the ability to chat to a live agent. So there we go, we've got our ticket created. Another area where having that embedded idle engine is gonna help is as it's part of that machine learning and understanding the types of tickets and requests that are coming through, that as I type, as I start to type in this in the search box, it's instantly coming back with suggested searches. So those are searches that are done by other people that might be helping me filter the type of result that I want to get, but also suggested results that have come back, come back and been used when people have typed similar type of things. Now I can obviously select any of those and go further, or I can hit return and look at my overall search results. And within that as well, I can see all those that data, I can go and view the knowledge articles, etc or I can start to filter down into the specific offerings or items within that as well. So having that ability to use that idle engine, that, embed, that natural language search to help solve the issues that I've got. Live support has been built specifically to help service desk agents, but it could be used for, by any other agents within the system. They can do the lookup against people or locations. So go with Aaron, uh, just because he's at the top of the list, just for simplicity right now. Um, and we can see all their existing tickets that they've raised. And it may be that we want to work on them. But in this example, Aaron's contacted us to say he's got an issue with his laptop. So we'll put, it's just saying he's got laptop issues. And then with my laptop, we'll put his laptop ID that he's told us. And you can instantly see here that it started to identify the laptop in there. So this here is doing that, that specific situation of that CI detection is kicking in and allowing us to auto populate data on the ticket. You can also see here that the smart suggestions that are coming back for the agents to help them with overall productivity. We're coming back with various suggested solutions, either from knowledge articles that we have within the system or maybe support requests that have been closed, which may have a solution that might be relevant to help here. We can also see recent incidents that might be going on within the, within the IT infrastructure that could be utilized to help solve the issue. And maybe we wanna link it to say, that's the issue that Aaron's got here, and we wanna link it to related as part of creating the ticket. Or alternatively, we can look at some of the various options we have in the system, and we can utilize those to help us move forward. Let's take a look at three more examples. Intelligent suggestions is all about helping an agent identify the right kind of values to put into categorization or setting the service. And this is again done by using machine learning to look at similar tickets and reduce the amount of effort required for the agent to populate fields. Next, when we want to look at optimization, we have change analytics as a really good example, which we'll demonstrate in a moment of how you can improve your overall change process. And then we also have hot topic analytics, which is across various different modules to help identify and do trend analysis, looking at patterns and clustering them together.
So from here in the dashboard, we're going to jump across to knowledge management first and look at some of that hot topic analytics. You can see already it's looking at all the requests that have been raised, and these are the ones where they're not associated with a service or a support offering in the catalog. You see here we have uh, clusters of similar and related tickets. If I drill into the virus one, we can see there's quite a few which are very similar descriptions. So by selecting those, we can then potentially create a new knowledge article, maybe informing your business users that there's an issue currently at the moment and how best to handle it. Or we can create a new support offering so we can streamline the approach on how we're going to generate new tickets. On top of that, you can also look at user questions. So our social Q&A feature, which is on the portal, which allows users to ask each other questions or have special subject matter experts answer them for you. You can see the type of questions that are being generated. And this can be quite useful if you've rolled out a new service. And the third option we got from the portal is about user searches. So this is looking at the actual searches that users are doing, taking that unstructured data and grouping them together. Now, obviously there's no tickets behind that, but you can see the number of uh, times this has been searched, but also how many hits within the search engine that's coming back for. So it may be highlighting areas where you need to do some improvement. We also have hot topic analytics on problem and on surveys to help you do the analysis across those modules. Now let's go and have a look at some change analytics. Before I look at the change analytics model, I wanted to show where we've got embedded analytics to help your agents whilst they're working. And from here, I'm looking at a set of change tickets, which are all in an active breach status. Um, and this one here, which is about doing it, upgrading the sales database. You can see on the right hand side, we have some various different statistics to help me as the user that's progressing this, and that could be the change owner, that could be the change manager to decide on whether we can do this outside of a breach window, but which ones have been uh, successful, which one have failed, uh, the potential risk associated with those tickets, and also the successful and failed tickets for me to go and have a look at and maybe try and understand what went wrong the first time. Change analytics is all about improving the overall flow of change within the business. We know change is important, it's ever going, it's always gonna happen. So this is about identifying ways to make those improvements. So the first, first one we got here is all about success rate. You can look at the individual change types and see how you're doing on those. So we can see we're okay on standard change. Normal change, we seem to have a bit of an improvement that we need to look at. An emergency change, yeah, we're pretty good on those as well. And you can change the, the various values for your KPI settings to fit with your business need. If we look at here, if we look at here at our normal changes, you can see it's suggesting that we've got obviously a bit of an improvement to do. But it's also then highlighting ways to do that improvement. So here it's showing that our demo exchange service, if we focused on those, we'd get a 10% overall improvement. On top of that, we've got the suggested action points to help you identify areas to, to improve. So if you can see here, it's highlighting that the models, the change models you've defined, the hardware upgrade and the Oracle upgrade are the, probably the most unsuccessful changes that you need to, again, focus on to make improvements. The second one is all about moving from normal to standard change. So it's identifying the normal change models and how you can identify them. They're always successful all the time and maybe you don't need to go through a change approval cycle as much. The Windows patch update is a good example there. And the final one is about automation and obviously about using standard KPI metrics to identify where improvements can be made and where certain particular change models could probably benefit from automation to make them more successful. That's it for this section. I'm gonna hand over to Daniel and he's gonna talk about the power of automation. Thank you, Dean. In the following minutes, let's talk about the power of automation in the enterprise service management context. Why automation is a must in every smart enterprise service management system. The repeatable processes performed in a manual way increase the risk for errors. Automating these um, processes, it can help you to reduce these errors. Also, it helps you to save time and money and to reduce operations costs by automating and coordinating time-consuming and manual tasks. And of course, you can increase the speed of service delivery and do more with faster response times and better quality. 
Configuring automation inside Smax is very easy. You can utilize business rule engine in Smax to start your automation journey. On different record entities, you can create business rules that can run on the record workflow to trigger automation. Some examples include reducing the choice selection for a user, updating data on a ticket after an action is performed to reduce manual processing, sending notifications to users, and also automatically closing the ticket once the solution has been added. Approval plans allow you to define a set of activities to manage the approval of a request, change, or a release. Define different approval strategies and have approvals in serial or in parallel. Define a governance level approval that applies to for all records of, of that type and dynamically include and exclude approvals based on the ticket. For example, ordering equipment over a certain total price results in a final sign-off. You can also define task plans that run in certain phases of a process flow to help drive completion. In the example shown, we have a flow that checks to see if there is an asset available in a stockroom and depending on if there is, allocates for the user and moves on to preparation, bypassing manual stock check allocation. Task plans can be a mix of automatic or manual tasks. So even when you might not be able to completely automate the process, the agent knows exactly what is needed to move forward. So you can bring all of this together in service catalog offerings or change models. This allows you to combine all that we've talked about so far into a predetermined workflow that can be executed time and time again with reduced failure and faster execution. Even better, this can be handled by appropriate process owners instead of system admins to continually improve over time. Now let's add to that the power of orchestration. Each task in the task plan can be automated using the included orchestration in SMAX. You can orchestrate complex workflows that require collecting information from multiple sources, a more robust control, queuing, error handling, reusability. You can reuse the same flows executed in multiple cases, simplified experience for uh, support agents. For example, uh, we can have a restart service process with orchestration. In this uh, simple workflow, we have a health check, uh, we detect failures, we can make backups, apply patches and restart the, the service. Once this is done, we can update the, the service request and let the, the user know. Now, let me ask you how the service management scenario looks in your organization and how long does it take to fulfill a request? Does it look like in this image where all the steps are manually performed and uh, there is a lot of interaction between the service agent and the users, which can take hours to days to complete? If it does, I have good news for you. With Smax, you can automate the entire process and reduce service delivery time to seconds. You can leverage on functionalities like OCR to identify the problem from a simple screenshot define test plans with advanced approval mechanisms, automate as many tasks using robot workers, and then in the end, survey users for their satisfaction level to continually improve your processes. Automation shouldn't give you headaches. This is why we try to simplify the workflow creation process as much as we can. With the codeless capabilities embedded in our web-based workflow designer, anyone can start to author their own orchestration workflows with a short learning curve. We provide capabilities like API-based content generator, where we can connect to a Swagger definition file and convert application endpoints in reusable content. With our RP capabilities included in the same workflow designer, you can record screen actions and convert those in operations that can be used in the same workflow. The drag and drop approach enables you to author advanced workflows with ease in our web-based modern interface. The graphical representation of the workflows helps anyone to understand the flow logic and to document the process. On top of that, we provide a large set of out-of-the-box content, ready-made integrations and sample flows that can help you to accelerate the authoring process. Let's see how we can leverage on these capabilities to create a password reset workflow for our Salesforce account. 
With this, any user can ask for a Salesforce password reset from the SMAC service desk, and his request will be fulfilled in an automatic way. We want to update our Cyber Arc Vault as well with the new password, and to let the user know that his request was successfully fulfilled by updating the request in SMAX. So let's go into orchestration workflow designer and see how this can be achieved. On the left side, we have our projects panel, the place where we will create our new project. We give it a name. And inside, we add a structure with a new folder and um, a new flow inside. This will be our uh, main flow. We add as inputs for this flow, the user for which we want to uh, reset the password and the new password. We will not need the current one because we will take it from Vault using a certificate authentication. Now let's go and use the new content uh, generator functionality. We upload a Swagger definition file, which is a JSON file that uh, defines all the uh, API endpoints that our CyberArk application exposes. Based on that, we can um, get the information. And here you see the list of all the APIs available. Uh, we will search for the um, APIs that uh, we need. Of course, we can select all of them and we will generate uh, um, operations for all of them. But uh, we, we can also select just specific ones and um, uh, get the information about those. So let's uh, select the retrieve uh, password API and also the update password API. These are the two operations that we, we want to create. Next, we will give a, a name for, for this project because um, uh, this content generator will generate a new uh, project with these operations inside. So let's call it CyberArk Panel. In the next step, we can add further uh, configurations like enabling authentication. Uh, we have different uh, kind of uh, authentication mechanisms that um, are available and can be enabled. Uh, for the purpose of uh, this demo, uh, we will not uh, enable authentication. Um, also, we can add uh, multiple requests, uh, headers, and, uh, and on, on this, all of this will, will be used uh, for all the operations. But again, for the purpose of this demo, uh, we will uh, allow those empty. We can see that those operations have been generated successfully. And if we go inside our new project that was generated by our tool, we will see that um, we have these two um, operations created that we can uh, reuse in our workflow. And we will do that. We will drag and drop uh, first retrieving the, um, the password because we need that password to, to log in, uh, in, in sales, uh, Salesforce. For that, we will need to, to provide some, some inputs like the account ID for our account in, in um, CyberArk and also the information that we, we need uh, to take. Uh, so we will put the, the username for which we need the password. And then as a result, the output that we want to, to expose uh, is the, the return result, which is the, the password. The next step um, will be a UI automation step. So we will create a new RP activity uh, from the workflow designer. We can right click in the, in the project and uh, click on the uh, record the new RP activity. We give it a name. And now the RPA recorder uh, will start. We click on the record button. And we start to record our steps inside Salesforce. First, the login steps. We put a username and the password, and we log in. All the steps, as you can see in the, the recorder uh, window, will be uh, recorded. You can see now that we have already three steps. We've done the, the login part, and now we need to uh, to go and record uh, the, the password reset steps. In order to do that, we click on the profile icon, click on settings. Again, all these steps are recorded. We go into change my password, exactly the same how we would do it uh, manually.
But of course, all of this will be replayed by, by our robots and we will be able to parameterize. So this is why here we will put some, some dummy data. We don't use the, uh, the real passwords. Uh, we just need uh, these steps to, to be recorded and then we can parameterize those. This is why uh, when we will click on the, the save button, uh, you will see that uh, it will give us an, an error. This will not happen when uh, the robot will perform uh, these actions because the right uh, passwords will be used. Okay, so all our uh, steps have been recorded. We click on, on stop button. We will be able to, to review them. And when we click on done, all of this will get back to our uh, workflow designer. Here we can see all the steps. And uh, as I said, we can parameterize. In order to do that, we will define some inputs uh, for this activity as well. So uh, we will need the user, uh, the current password, and also the new password uh, that we want to, to set. Going back to the RP activity, we can map these inputs to the specific steps. So the first one where, where we provide the user, it will take uh, from the user variable, then the password is the current password that is used for, for the login. And then for the password changing steps, we will need again to provide the current password. We will take it from the, from the variable. These, as you can see, are sensitive inputs. So we will encrypt them. Once we are done, we can save the changes and close this activity. Now let's dra uh, drag and drop the activity in our uh, main workflow. And let's connect the first two steps together. Next, uh, we will bring the password update operation that uh, was created with the content generator because we want to update our vault. But before that, uh, let's map um, the inputs for the uh, reset password uh, step. So we need a user, as I mentioned, the current password, we get it from the uh, previous step. And then the, the new password, which we get it from the uh, flow input. So the user will provide it um, when he, he will uh, make the, the request for the password changing. Let's uh, connect uh, the third step and provide inputs for uh, this step as well. Again, the, the account ID and also the, the change properties, the password that uh, we need to change. Before uh, connecting to success, uh, the last step, as I mentioned, it will be a step in which um, uh, we will update the, the request uh, in Smack. So in order to, to do that, uh, we will utilize our um, out of the box uh, Smacks integration that is available on our marketplace. You can search in the entire collection for the integration that you need. Once you find it, you can download and let's do that. And then uh, this package, we will deploy it in our workflow designer. In the dependencies panel is the place where we can import all the, the content packs, either the out of the box or the content packs that uh, uh, we have created before. So let's go and um, upload the content pack that we, we get from, uh, from the marketplace and import it. Okay, and now let's uh, look for the operation that we need. Uh, supposingly that uh, this is coming from an incident, this request is coming from an incident, let's uh, use the update incident. Of course, we can uh, uh, use other um, operations that are available as well, for example, updating the, the request itself. But uh, for, for the purpose of this demo, we will use the, the update incident operation. So let's drag and drop uh, uh, this operation in our workflow. Okay. Here we will get uh, uh, all our uh, information from the system properties that have been defined in our projects, uh, like for example, the, the SMAX URL, the SSO token that um, is needed in order to log in, the tenant ID, and also the, the incident ID. Let's connect the last step as well. And in the end, we will connect um, the entire workflow to the success. 
the failure is all, already defined in the default failure. We can add uh, if we need uh, a specific step or operation to be performed if uh, any of these steps uh, fail. We can debug the workflow or we can create a content pack from this project or directly deploy to our uh, central interface where it will be triggered by Smacks. So this is how you can create a new orchestration workflow from scratch and automate your process without having to write any line of code. And when you adopt orchestration or engage in more use cases, you will see that it delivers results. Here we have some highlights from customers and what they've achieved. Many of our customers easily save more than 250 man hours per month and some more than 2,500 man hours. They've achieved excellent value for money, reduced errors, reduced costs, and speed up service delivery. Now I will handle it back to Dean to discover even more innovation. Dean, back to you. Thank you, Daniel. So now we're going to switch and look at Smack Studio and how you can extend service management across your organization. Smack Studio is the core of the administration of our product and allows you to build out your business rules, your workflows, your processes of all the out of the box modules. But it also, as part of Smack Studio, gives you the ability to define and build your own apps. This allows you to cover off maybe some areas of enterprise service management and support services across other lines of business within your organization and provide a similar user experience through the self-service portal. And of course, all being built on our codeless extensibility, so you can build it very easily, very quickly, without it having an impact on the updates and upgrades to the system. The other thing that's key for us is making sure that it's simple to use. And that's really so it allows people within the business to define their workflows, their processes and the rules that they need and, and, and for administrators to help understand their use cases to build it out in studio or even maybe you get them to do it themselves as citizen coders. We're showing how easy it is to build an app in these six steps is really giving you the art of the possible, how you can build out an enterprise class app within the Smax platform to extend out across through your business. So the app that we're going to showcase and just do little snippets of as we go through this is an app that was designed and shown all about reopening offices in a, in a post-COVID world. So as we know, a lot of offices are not going to be operating in the same way. There's going to be a need to understand from a facilities management perspective, from an IT management perspective, about having the right equipment at desks, uh, making sure the right capacity in offices is accommodated for, and also making sure that things are cleaned as needed. So the app that we're going to show, walk through and show a little snippets of in this section is really going to have a need for uh, being able to request as a user uh, that you want to come into the office on a particular day, maybe get a hold of some car parking space, um, and then making sure the appropriate tasks are made available and the appropriate people are notified to make sure that that's all as seamless as possible and we're controlling the flow and reducing risk to anyone that's coming to the office. The first step that we need to do is we need to look at actually building out the actual app itself. So really simply, you can go within Smack Studio, you can go across to uh, the menu, add in the, uh, the record types that you need, and that starts the process off for you. The next step is about building out the workflow. So when you build out your new record entity types, you want to decide on the overall process flow that they're going to they're going to adhere to. Now, when you're building out first, we have this concept of the phases that you need to do. There's the first initial. When you're building out your workflow, there's the 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 when you're building out your workflow, there's an ask to obviously set your initial phases that your process is going to flow through, uh, but you can then modify that as you need. And as you can see here, we're adding a few extra additional phases to get out that overall high level workflow of what's needed. The next step is all about adding the different fields that you want to populate data in and to record as part of your app. So here, you can, within Smack Studio, you can there are a number of out-of-the-box fields that are created on every record entity type, all the standard ones you'd expect to see across the other record types, like discussion comments, your main description, your uh, 
start and end date as, as examples. Uh, but then you can add additional fields of the various different record type, uh, the various different field types we have in the system. So you maybe could add some short description fields. You could add some uh, what we call entity link fields that allows you to link to other record types within the system or even drop down lists and you can build out and add that. And here is a quick example where we go and we create the list that we want within the system and then we go and add that into the record type. And of course, any list that you create is available across the other modules as well. So if you wanted to then reutilize that list on another field on another record, you can do so as well. Next step is all about setting up the forms. So we have three form types uh, for every record entity type when you're creating a new one and you might want to create some specific rules or only have data entry for certain fields. When you're looking at the preview, that's what you see within the views. When you're looking at the, the grid of all the of all tickets that have been uh, records that have been created, uh, all the full form as well. Now, this is about adding all the fields onto the form that you're obviously going to want to see. Uh, but it's not setting any rules around visibility, mandatory requirements, or maybe if you want to restrict data to certain certain roles. Um, and that's something that we'll do when we get to the next stage, when we look at defining the business rules. This, this is all about building out all the extra steps and all the extra things that you want to occur during that process. So maybe you want it so that when someone populates a certain field, that another field is mandatory. Maybe you want to set the system up so that as when a certain value is set, it moves the record forward or data is hidden from certain users or you're disabling fields from data entry. Maybe they're specific fields that you want uh, to be read only to users on that, on that record type. Business rules in SMACs are built on a very straightforward system. We have what we call business rule templates. So based on where you are within the workflow, you can define the types of business rules that you can run. And some of those may be you know, based on the rendering rules. Others could be related to where you're relating the record to other records. And maybe after relating, you want to trigger an update on that record type. Likewise, you can also do it to run automation or uh, API calls out to other systems to pull back pull back data. So you've got a real wealth of configuration capabilities within the way that you define your business rules. The final main step when you're building out your, your app is thinking about service portal integration. In the example that we're talking about here around returning to offices, what we want to do is obviously make it easy for your end users, your business users to be able to raise raise tickets from the portal to say they're going to be returned to work on a specific date. So this is where you build out your catalog offering. And as part of building out that catalog offering, you can define again business rules, you can find specific fields that you want them to populate as they do it. And then you can build out a workflow of how that's going to be going to be done. Because we would want with this particular studio app for it to be all managed within the record type that we have. One of the extra things that we've done as part of the steps and the part of the workflow is set it up so that it auto creates the record for us as part of that workflow. It's then after doing that and all the data has been passed to it, closing down that request. Now, the reason we go through that is because from a service portal perspective, whenever a user is reaching, going onto the service portal, they're looking for either support or a particular service or to try and get some information. So those obviously on the portal are all around about requests or knowledge articles. So when we do service portal integration, there's a request that's raised. And then off the back of that, we're then going to create that app record as needed. And there are some use cases where you may want to do some, maybe some approvals or some additional steps that you want to do on the request level before you generate that record, other record entity for your studio app at a later point. Okay, that's it with your app built. You're now in a situation where you can uh, package that app and move it uh, as needed. And that's something that we want to highlight at this point because for us, we've built the Smack Studio app marketplace specifically designed so that you can build out your apps 
that to help you in your business, but share that with a wider community. That allows everyone to then take those apps that have been built and use them as a starter uh, and to tailor to fit to their business needs. And we've already got quite a number already on the uh, studio marketplace uh, that have been created by ourselves as MicroFocus from different uh, parts of the organization, uh, from our professional services, also from our partners that work and, and, and help other customers with, with SMACs, and also for some of our customers as well, where they've built them for specific use cases and thought that would be good and share with their peers. You can head over across to the marketplace and all the apps, once you've signed in, uh, are available for you to download and load into your system. And we've, most of them include a documentation, maybe if there's any additional configuration you need or potential ways to expand on it, uh, as well as to identify which versions it's available for. But the good thing is, is the majority of studio apps, once built and packaged, are available uh, from any version of Smacks. We do not have to worry about whether there's uh, compatibility issues with different versions of the product. And if this is expired, and if this has inspired you to build a studio app, or maybe you've already done one uh, within your organization, we'd love to have you share that with the community and bring that to our studio app marketplace. You reach out to us and we'll organize to help you get that set up on the marketplace. So if we think about taking the concept of your service desk and that AI and machine learning capabilities that we've talked about earlier, and then bringing in the power of automation, uh, whether that's that process automation within the product, or whether that's using operations orchestration, um, it allows you to make yourself service more engaging, more uh, easier for you to fulfill requests fast, um, maybe even reducing the overall time consuming manual work that's needed. On top of that, you can build out your custom workflows, whether that's within the task plans on those requests or you're spinning out to a Smack Studio app, and also eliminate human errors. So it means that things are getting done right first time. So when you have service desk and AI and automation, you're getting five. That's right. One plus one plus one equals five. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to it, to myself and Daniel on this on this session. 